the clock. Yes. Okay, the first thing up is public comment recognition of guests. And we do not have anyone that turned in for public comment. So up next we have um, presentations. Uh, first thing is exemplary night. Okay, for our exemplary night staff members, you have been recognized by your peers for your exemplary work. As a Board of Education, we want to thank you for your efforts and positive impact on Blue Ridge. Please come forward when I call your name. Uh, from Schneider Elementary, we have Lucy Mink. She's unable to be here, but. Um, from the Intermediate Junior High, we have Raquel Eshelman. And from the high school, we have Lori Friel. Okay. Yep. <laughs> Not with us in the background. <laughs> Let me just hide behind you. <laughs> and tonight we also recognize the exemplary actions that uh, have brought uh, several students to the attention of their teachers and principal. As a Board of Education, we appreciate your efforts and excellence. Um, when I call your name, please come forward. From the high school, we have Gracie Wingert. Also from the high school, we have Rylan Umstad. Look how little he looks. From eighth grade, we have Linnea Warsaw. I know, I know. From seventh grade, we have Isabella Jenkins. From sixth grade, we have Emma Drinkwater. From fifth grade, we have Zandon Swanstrom. From fourth grade, we have Kendall Mitchum. Third grade, Joseph Drinkwater. From second grade, we have Lena Flessner. First grade is Anna Crawford. And kindergarten, Elliot Huff. Okay, up next we have the transportation plan. I don't think I have to do this going on around. <laughs> I was peeing. Oh, we don't, we don't <laughs> Thanks for coming on a cold night. <laughs> it's an after this. <laughs> Boy. Good. Yeah, Works now. Yeah, batteries go. Oh, okay. Good luck. Okay. All right. So you guys all got one of these in your packets, right? Yes. 
My so I was just kind of explaining my trading here. And it's in here. The far left, you see the current 2023-24. That is all the vehicles that we presently have. The next section over, G through J, is the proposal. Recent information is the next one over from K to N. As we come down to the second layer, we have our current vehicles that are not buses. That's our white buses and maintenance trucks. At the bottom, I did mention that we are limiting our transportation trucks to maintenance. And then we'll see if we actually need it back or not after the time is up. I have initials throughout the board here of DB means Boy Bird, IC means for International Corporation, and WP is White Activity Bus. That being said, Trip can happen 
Deborah, we missed a little bit. Sorry, I didn't catch this before we posted the spreadsheet. <clears throat> I think our cells got combined a little bit. Can you give us four prices, please? Starting with the Bluebird, the five-year gas price. The Bluebird five-year gas price would have been twenty-two thousand and fifty-eight cents. Five years diesel would have been twenty-two thousand and forty-eight fifty cents. IC five-year diesel for a seventy-eight passenger versus seventy-seven is twenty-three four seventy-two. Thank you. I had a, is it working? All right. I had a question about, so it's 35 cents per mile over 16,000 miles with the international. So, I mean, how much do they actually end up costing us by the time we end up running all of our routes? Because I know some of our bus routes are like, I think one of them was 240 miles a day for like three 380 mile trips, you know, running around. I mean, it ends up, it ends up adding up pretty quick, and we're looking at the end of the lease, we'll have, you know, 190,000 miles on a bus, and well, we'll be only, we'll only have been allotted 75,000 or something like that, so we're going to be paying a lot of dough <laughs> making up the mileage at the end of the lease. Have we ever? Since I've been here, we've never paid the extra. Oh, sweet. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Okay. Up next, we have communication. First up is FOIA request. Okay. FOIA request from Smart Procure on 1218 of 23, asking for purchasing records from the middle of September to the middle of December. That was um, responded to in a timely fashion. And then Smart Procure again at the end of December wanted to know the purchasing records specifically for BRIJHS from January 1st of 2018 up until the current time. And again, that was given to them. That's what caused hundreds of pages in your board book. Um, and that's it for FOIA requests. And then, Francie, I'll turn it back to you for the IASB talking points. Okay. So next we have the IASB uh, talking points that were sent. It's actually in the packet this time. Um, the, they had three things that they wanted to share was the share of the success proposals are being accepted for next year's joint annual conference, <coughs> which is crazy how early that is. Um, they also talk about the volunteers <coughs> needed to review those panel submissions. Um, so if anyone wants to volunteer to review any of those um, submissions for proposals for the joint annual conference, you can email Patrick Allen, and I'm sure he'll accept you to do that. <laughs> Did? Do you want to? <laughs> um, and then the other thing that they have is just to be watching for in your email the division dinner meetings that will happen in March. I, I really thought I might get something today. They sent, seem to send me the next month on the day right we meet. <laughs> Because this one came on the day of our December meeting last month. So I'll probably get it tomorrow. So we'll see what, what, what comes yeah. up then. Okay, up next we have committee reports. Okay, committee reports. Uh, Finance committee met with Kent Cool, the district auditor, at 5.30 tonight via Zoom. And he went over the FY23 annual financial report. <clears throat> We have those available for you. I believe that was out at your place tonight, so you can take a look at that. Some of the highlights there. Um, we get scored by our district finance financial um, status, and we raised our score in FY23 to a 3.9 out of 4, and that's called a recognition status. We were recognition status the year prior, but the score is higher within the category this time. Um, and they did give us a couple things they'd like us to work on, and Kara Wallace will be helping us with those things. And I think that's all for that report, and you'll be approving that hopefully later into new business. Okay. Up next, we have administrative reports. Hillary. Okay, back to me. Um, my report I talked a little bit about e-learning. Very appropriate because we used that this week. So. 
conditions were cold enough that um, all the neighboring districts, I believe, were either out for e-learning or an emergency day, and we followed suit with that on Tuesday, uh, announcing it fairly early on Monday, which hopefully was appreciated. Um, just an update for you that our bond proceeds um, from our sale were received at the very end of the year in December, and those were not, you'll see, we'll do the quarterly financial report next, you'll see those weren't um, added to that report yet because they weren't in Skyward. They were in the bank, but not in Skyward uh, by 1231. Uh, let's see, we do, uh, we will be talking a little bit more about the track money and the HLS money that's in there because we are going to be um, doing some investment with that, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and the current, the current projects that we're working on for HLS, I feel like I've said this many times, but we'll just keep uh, reiterating what our list is. This building, we're working on replacing the chillers in this building. <laughs> just kind of funny tonight. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the big and small chiller, we have to replace both of those items and have all the labor to go along with it. That's part of an HLS project. Um, the BRIJHS HVAC project was finished by the end of December before kids came back in January. Um, and that is an emergency HLS item, meaning that we can spend HLS funds on that. Uh, we are underway with uh, roofing plans, uh, working with our new architect, Scott Wachter from IGEW. And we have also had conversations about secure entries here in this building, and that would all be HLS funding. Uh, the other thing that was mentioned in my report is we are looking into a new safety app. We currently use an app called Navigate Prepared. That's a free app for us, and it's a way for um, administrators or myself to communicate quickly with all staff members if there's an emergency. Um, there's a lot of features that were, I'd say, navigate prepared. I guess I'd call it an early app, early safety app. There's a lot of other pieces that have been um, added to many other companies in their app. Crisis Go is what we've uh, kind of played around with and demoed twice now, um, with first responders included on our second demo. And this has some pretty strong capabilities. It can break through a silenced phone, which is what we're having problems with. Teachers don't leave their ringers on when they're in the classroom. So how would you know if you were getting an alert? Um, Navigate Prepared said that they had a way to work around that, but it was not consistent whatsoever. So Crisis Go breaks through with the strength of, like with the technology of an Amber Alert. Um, so everybody would be getting messages. Plus, we can probably get it to come onto the view boards in the classroom and give an alert, and it also can come to your desktop and your laptop. So as long as you open that up in the morning when you come to your classroom, you're going to be able to have that first audible alert. And it's quite loud, and it will get everybody's attention like it needs to. There's also a way for us to get a substitute teacher who's in the building just for a day at a time. Um, they can have the app on their phone, which would be part of how they get started with um, Blue Ridge as a sub, and then they would have access to a QR code when they get signed in, in the morning, so then their phone would be alerted if they were in a classroom and we had an emergency, which has always been a concern. What do you do with somebody who just doesn't have our training? So those are all pretty heavy reasons why I would like to go with Crisis Go. It does come with a price, um, but it's safety of our kids, and it's definitely worth it. So. Uh, we'll be presenting that also to District ILT, which meets tomorrow afternoon. And this app, when we move in that direction, is going to take a couple months to build all the background information because it's going to require all of the digital floor plans and safety plans and call lists that we have and new call lists will need to be established as well. So it'll be a couple months with, worth of work before we're fully functional. So that's my report. If there's no questions, I'll go on to the quarterly financial report. Um, board members, you have that in front of you, the colored version. I will, let's see, bring to your attention first that for the first time this year we have audited fund balances in column D. Uh, so those are our numbers from the a AFR that you just got tonight. And then next what I do is I go to... Um, Actually, I go all the way to J next. That's where my brain goes. I want to see what our expenditures look like to date since we're, this report is as of the end of December, so 50% through the way of the fiscal year. So I look up at the top to see in column J that we are less than 50% in all of our um, funds up there, fund 10, 20, 40, and 70 are all less than 50% in expenditures, so that's good. That means we correctly overestimated our expenditures. When you look down at the bottom, 
in, still in column J, you'll see numbers all over the place. These are different funds. Bond and interest has a very high expenditure. That's because we've paid for our principal, um, meaning principal on the bond, not, <laughs> not principals like administrators. Um, so that's high because of the timing of those payments. Um, Fund 50, IMRF and Social Security, that matches the top because that's a, an ongoing payment that's pretty level throughout the year. Fund 60, Site and Construction, um, we do not have any current projects coming out of that fund that we're paying for right now. That will include the chairlift being replaced at Snyder, but those bills are not coming in yet, so uh, when they are, we'll be using money from that pot. Uh, tort, uh, as we've said last quarter, 66%. That's usually coming out very high at the beginning, and that's because we pay all of our insurance premiums at the beginning of the fiscal year. Health, life, safety. We're doing a lot of HLS preparation work, but the bills don't come in as quickly as the work starts, so that's why you see a very low number there. But, um, you know, in the next couple quarters, you're going to see that number starting to rise. And then I go back and I look at the revenues. Again, I want to see that we've received at least 50% of our money. Again, what we were anticipating in our revenues this fiscal year was a little bit low compared to our expenses that we expected. And that's because we got early taxes. So when those taxes came in in June of 23, we didn't get to show them as potential revenues. Instead, they show up in your fund balances because that's where the money's sitting. Um, so of what we are expecting, up at the top, you'll see in funds 10, 20, 40, and 70, if you look at column G, you'll see that we're doing very well. We're, we've received more than half of what we anticipated. That's good. Taxes are coming in. And then down at the bottom, um, you'll notice kind of the same thing. We're, we're doing very well in, in what's coming in. Um, and like I mentioned previously, bond proceeds were received at the end of December, but they were not entered into Skyward because those are two, obviously, separate systems. So those were entered in January, and you'll see that next time. And we already talked about the early taxes, so I think that's I think that's where we are. Any questions on the QFR? Okay. That's all I have. All right, uh, Ms. Payton is not here, so Bert, do you want to go next? Oh, there it's on. So I'll make it quick so I can get in here. Um, so thanks. Forgive me for my absence last month. That's not something I intend to do too often, but I did have my 15-year illness, so I'm kind of out of the way. Uh, it's pretty rough, but we got through it. Um, just a couple of quick things to share, being that it's kind of a short month coming back from break. I want to thank you guys for helping our staff uh, and providing for our curriculum day. Um, you know, as, as teachers, having meetings at the end of a day, um, you know, it's part of what they do, but their battery levels get taken down, right, because they've been working hard all day. But So to have days like the curriculum day right before school starts, it really helps us have kind of a day of adult professional learning. So I really appreciate you guys providing that. This year, we kind of focused on um, looking at some of uh, the, the, the changes in our multi-tiered systems of support and how that's meshing with our social emotional learning and how the systems of support are designed to, to be part of all of that system. Additionally, Tri-County uh, Special Education Cooperative was able to come over and work with all of our case managers to talk about IEP writing, writing goals, and just, uh, it was a great refresher for all of them that you just need to hear once in a while, hearing different perspectives, maybe changes that have happened in the how they're wanting those to be written, maybe some legislative changes, just things that people don't always get to talk about on a day-to-day -day basis and be able to sit with your colleagues and bounce ideas off of each other in, in that really kind of unique setting where they were all involved with helping um, write really good IPs for our kids. Um, also, we had the opportunity to um, have our teachers learn some de-escalation techniques as part of the CPI curriculum. They didn't obviously get into any of the restraints or anything, which if you've ever been to that training, that training really is about 95% of like, how do you not get in that conflict cycle with children and how do you work on de-escalating them because obviously that last resort always would be putting your hands on a kid. So we focused primarily with those for our teachers that hadn't ever had any formal CPI training um, that happens in the summertime. 
Um, additionally, we had our winner, our second uh, diagnostic, our winter diagnostic done right before um, we left for Christmas break. We've had some time to work on those in collaboration. And I'm really excited that compared to this time last year, we're seeing higher growth numbers in our students across the board and, and reading and mathematics both. So this program that you guys have invested in is showing some results and we continue to use that data to talk about. Um, it was great, I was talking to Dr. Stanifer, that was, you know, as I met with our fourth, fifth and sixth grade teachers, it was great to be able to talk about every single student in those grade levels and where they are at on the, in reading and mathematics. So it's pretty exciting and we'll be having our collaborations where we'll be using that data for junior high this coming week, next week. Um, and then lastly, um, our single Yes, um, so one of our big things that we're working on at the uh, junior high level is the behavior. So I, I like these reports where we know how many referrals they were, there were and stuff like that, but I, once again, we have nothing to compare it to to know if it actually is improving. Like compared to last year and last school year, how many referrals do we have at this point in the school? And I know you can't be you can't say it has to be lower because kids change every year and things arise, but we would like to see a general trend of behavior. So is there any way in your reports you can include these reference point, points for us to actually see the hard data to know if our behavior is in fact improving at the school? Okay. Thank you. Uh, actually, yeah, because we had our last board meeting, you know, the Christmas break, and then we meet in the back of the curriculum day, and my teachers are doing a lot of the, the same stuff there. And um, one thing that is new that we're piloting at the high school right now um, is a, a digital pass program where, you know, the old school way, the one who leaves class, teacher writes out a pass, and we all still have to sit six days and show the notes why your teacher received the pass. Um, so I really like the grade analysis, and but one of the things that I was concerned about back when I was teaching, not, not of course when I was a student, um, but is uh, the grade inflation. Um, I, and I would love to believe that my children are extraordinarily smart, but I'm pretty positive they're just average. Um, but it seems like if we're going with how generally there are the standard deviations, 
are you at all concerned about grade inflation at our school, looking at the percentage of kids, like almost 50% of our freshmen are getting A's? Yeah. And, and I had a teacher ask me, well, what's it supposed to look like? Yeah. Um, and I don't believe that it should be a true bell curve, right. you know, with 1A and everybody's in the C range of 1F. Mm -hmm. um, you know, typically, you know, you skew toward the A to B range and then, you know, a few um, stragglers down, but um, yeah, that's a, that's a very fair question. Mm -hmm. um, it could be that there are some classes that tend to maybe be easier A's and, and maybe there's a, a, a chunk of kids in those yeah. Yeah, I, I just I just noticed that in every grade level, the highest percentage is in A's, which is great if that is what they should actually be earning. I just I know like as a parent, if I got my kid and I had, they had all A's, I'd be like super stoked. Um, but I would also hope that we are giving kids a real reflection of what they do know and what they need to continue to work on. Just be glad you're not teaching my child. <laughs> Never get a word in. Um, <laughs> yeah, I just, yeah, I, I mean, it's great. I, and I know that we're making huge strides academically. I just don't want us to, um, Especially, you know, as we know, like more and more kids are going into college having to take remedial classes. I don't want us to be setting our students up for that when college is already so expensive. I'd rather they go in right away to the classes that they are set to take and just go straight from there. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. I had a question too. I was checking out the discipline data, and so detentions decreased from 120 last year during the same time period to 47.
So there's been a shift um, uh, in that regard with Blaine. I think I can, I can start to speak to that. Uh, with the I have a question going back to the grades. Um, do we, are we able to understand if those grades, like compared to the A's, are the kids getting B, C's, D's? Is it a understanding problem or is it a lack of effort problem? Like I'm just not turning in the grades, but I understand how to do geometry just fine, right? Is it the skill part or is it the, I, don't, I just don't feel like doing homework? we can do to help make that happen tools you know like i i strongly believe in you know we use outside vendors all the time to crunch data because somebody who does that for a living is way better at it than somebody who's going to do it you know sporadically so I'd, <laughs> so, um, yeah, the, I, I think we're, we're definitely seeing uh, a shift in a, in a good direction. Has there been any talk about standards based grading? We've had that discussion for since I've been here. And uh, in fact, Snyder Elementary, one of the ways that um, a lot of building, a lot of districts go, and you're probably well aware of this, is one grade level at a time. Yeah. Um, just kind of increasing that as you go. That way you get a band of parents that understand that from the early grades. The kids assessment that we use at kindergarten, that's already standards based. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a matter of do we, do we have the time and the manpower to sit down as a first grade team. I mean, Mr. Payton meets with them monthly and they're looking at data and they're looking at instructional improvements. It's really hard to then also get to what's the assessment piece and can we, can we look at defining what those critical um, components are for each grade level learning. But uh, I don't think there's anybody at Snyder that would be, at least as of two years ago, I'd say, that would be opposed to that. It's just a massive amount of work to get there. Oh yeah, I was, at Fisher I was on the standards-based curriculum committee then I left, thank God, because that was a lot of work. So. I think that that mindset is the right mindset. Mm -hmm. um, it is, that's, it's, it's really hard to implement that, to implement that from where we are to from a standard base. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that's exactly how you want to think about it. Uh, <laughs> okay, and then the rest of the reports are in the packet. I don't. Did you want to say anything about transportation since you're here? Not much. 
the transportation report. I just wanted to give you the opportunity. She's like, no. <laughs> I do want to invite you. It's fun. It always has. But I'm, any of you guys who are on the board are welcome to go this morning and join us and have fun and have it all day. Okay, up next we have the approval of consent items. And I need a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda items listed on attachment A as presented. <laughs> Jonathan and Chelsea. Yes. 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 Okay, up next we have old business. The first item being press 113, second reading. Okay, so we went through this last month. There are no uh, significant issues with press 113. It's an issue that's doing a lot of revisions and cleaning things up. And I um, would recommend that we approve the entire press 113. Okay. Are there any questions or discussion? If not, I need a motion and a second to approve press 113 policies for Blue Ridge CUSD number 18 as presented. So moved. Seconded. Kenna and Chelsea. Yes. 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 Okay, now we're on to new business. The first item is review for approval of 2022-23 annual audit and shared services report and fiscal efficiency schedule. Okay, so you've heard about this a couple times tonight, those who are at the finance committee. So our report was a clean report, as Kent said, and again, we are in the recognition status, 3.9 out of 4. Um, there are a couple recommendations that we will be working on this year with capitalizing of our um, bus leases and also making sure that our um, activity accounts are inside of our funds to have it reported correctly due to new standards with GASB. Um, so right now the request is that you would approve the report that you heard from Kent Cool tonight. Are there any questions? And, and just for those that weren't there, our, our score was a 3.9, last year was a 3.55, so it was just nice to see that it had come up quite a bit higher to that 4.0. So on that note, though, I need a motion and a second to approve the 2022-2023 annual financial report, shared service report, and the fiscal efficiency form for the Blue Ridge CUSD number 18, conducted by Cole and Associates, LLC, Shelbyville, Illinois, as presented. So moved. Sig. Second. Jason. Sorry. <laughs> yes. Yes. Up next, we have discussion of Illinois funds. So a few months ago, Jason had approached me and asked about if we had ever looked at um, investing our district funds with a program called Illinois Funds. And Kara was arriving right about that time. She has experience from a prior district with doing that investment. And so we would, uh, we've shown you a couple documents in your board packet, uh, but the um, interest rate that we can get with um, investing with Illinois funds is significantly higher than what we can get at the bank right now. So with the new bond proceeds that have come into the district are three million dollars for the track. Uh, the major great majority of that will not be expended until 2025 and so it would be prudent for us to be investing until that time. Uh, HLS, as you can see, we've been doing some HLS initial work, but we haven't paid anything yet. So um, a lot of the projects that we're doing are going to be larger and long term. So uh, it makes sense to at least put some of the HLS funds aside into investment right now. The nice thing about Illinois funds, other than the significant increase in the interest rate, is that you can get those funds back into your own um, you know, count, accounts for spending within 24, maybe 48 hours, uh, depending on the timing. So it's not like they lock you down for 60 days, six months, things like that. So, um, and Kara is an expert in being able to um, run all the spreadsheets so she can keep track of all the interest that's going into the various funds. So when that comes back in, that will be um, 
divided accordingly. So tonight we would be asking um, that we could invest 5,000 of the new, uh, sorry, 5 million from the new bond proceeds <laughs> with <laughs> Illinois funds. <laughs> Just testing the waters. Real <laughs> risky. <laughs> you were well, listening. <laughs> <laughs> They're even asking for five thousand. <laughs> Anyways, continue. Sorry. I think that was it. I think it's ready for your motion. <laughs> I, had, I had a question about that. Um, if we let's say we take HLS fund money and invest it, does the money that returns, right, that we make off of that, does it have to go back to HLS or can it be used? Goes right back where it came from, okay, and, and the we, interest goes into that same fund. We we don't have a choice. Nope. Okay. Nope. We can grow it. We can't reassign so, it. So the nice option with that would be that if other HLS things come up, we then don't have to bond for it. There's right. maybe money that could be used towards other things. Right. I'm guessing that more things will come up. Yeah. Perhaps. <laughs> you think? More, more <laughs> things will break. No. Yeah. Another question regarding the Illinois funds, why don't we do that with more of our money? Or is this just kind of the beginning of trying it out, seeing how it works yeah, with we're, this? we're going to see. Kara has experience with that, and we sat down together and talked about how much money. We looked at when, um, when we knew that invoices would start coming in for the reasons associated with the bonding. Um, that was our, our decision to start with that. And if we want to look at more, because our fund balances are, are doing fine, then we can do that then too. That's exactly what I was wondering about. There you go. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Any other questions or comments? One, one other question. What is the lag time in pulling fund out of the Illinois fund? fund Illinois 48 funds? hours. 48 hours? At the most. Okay. Yeah. And there wouldn't be any effect from like a government shutdown or anything like that on the ability to get funds out of there if, I don't know, Illinois. I would, I would not expect so, but I don't think that we would ever be waiting till 48 hours to pull something back out either. So I think we're fine. All right. <laughs> okay. So then I need a motion and a second to approve the investment of district funds into the Illinois funds program with the initial investment amount of $5 million for Blue Ridge CUSD number 18 as presented. So moved. Second. And Jason. Yes. Yes. Okay. Up next, we have consideration for approval of the transportation plan for fiscal year 25. Okay. So Deborah presented that to you this evening, and so her recommendation, and I agree with it, would be to go with the international bus uh, for the five year. That's a diesel, and the annual cost would be twenty three thousand four hundred seventy two dollars. A little bit more than a Bluebird, but it's shown. And and I don't think Deborah mentioned this, but um, Rich Foyles, who is now serving as our mechanic, is also in strong agreement with uh, going with the IC versus the Bluebird. Um, it's worth the small increase in annual fee to get the better better equipment and the better service. I have a question. What, I, I didn't ask Rich, and I didn't ask earlier when you were talking about it. What's Rich's perspective on owning the buses and the maintenance required of buses as they start to get older? I know these only come with the three-year warranties. If you did buy one for $140,000, but with what we're shelling out over five years i mean you're pretty close to the full payment amount on a on a bus anyways i mean how expensive is it to keep them going up to five years i mean i just i kind of wonder about the maintenance and you know all the troubles that they have between that three and five year mark uh, deborah can you go to a microphone <clears throat> They won't be able to hear you. It's they. It's it, my brother. Yeah, it's the online people. <laughs> there, there's no. Th yes, he already sent one text. <laughs> I, gosh, only knows. Okay, now can you hear me? Oh, yes. I don't. I just saw Chris. I was like, oh no. <laughs> okay, personally, I did not ask him that question, but I know that he did previously state to Hillary on he was happy that we were having leases, and I'll give you just. A real quick example, one tire got a bolt in it this big. 
It cost us $600 to replace the one tire on a bus. By the time we're done with the um, leases, they're just coming up time due for, ti for tires, so we never end up having to pay that unless I get a bolt this big in it. And you can't see that while you're driving, so sorry about that. That was my fault. <laughs> um, but that's just one example. The heater in the rear of the um, wheelchair bus last year was $1,000. So those are just two minor parts that you might have to change out many times throughout the service of a bus that we own, and we'd have to pay out of pocket each time that we do that. And as we know, things aren't getting any cheaper, so. How old is the wheeled chair bus? The old wheelchair bus well, that? No, I just didn't know how old the wheeled chair bus was that we had. It was at its five year. Oh, it was at five years. Mm -hmm. How much is a bus worth after five years with a hundred and sixty thousand miles on it, or hundred and hundred thousand, I guess? Because we're keeping all these under the sixteen thousand per year, so really they probably all have under a hundred thousand miles on them, right? Right. Um, well, I asked them last year when I was trying to compare on whether we should lease or keep like the white bus, mm -hmm. and the white bus they charged us forty thousand for after paying on it for five years. Everything's double to triple depending on who you go through and what style, style of bus that you get. The wheelchair bus was one of the more expensive because of the wheelchair components. So, I mean, I can't sit there and give you figures on how much it would cost us a year to do without sitting there calculating everything out. But I do know that at five years, you're gonna have to have a whole round of tires. At five years, you're also gonna be starting replacing multiple different parts, not just one or two. At three years, the bus starts deteriorating. So parts inside, like the headrest as you walk out the door, will start falling off. Um, different parts of the seats and stuff. On some of the bluebirds at the time of three years, they start to dip in a little bit where it's not so comfortable. You start filling the springs and stuff in them. Four was at the two years when I got here, bus number four, and its back seat had completely caved in and we had to replace it. They had to replace it, we didn't. Mm -hmm. But if it was our bus, we'd end up replacing that. So it's multiple things and it depends on the bus and how the quality of the bus is made. I can tell you since 2020, the quality of the build on the buses have went drastically down. So that's where a lot of the problem is, and that's one of the things that I look at when I recommend which bus to get is what kind of problems that we've had with them over the three and five years that we've had them, and where do they start deteriorating? Okay. Does that help? Yeah, it does. I just kind of looking at it, and you know, you're five to ten thousand dollars in expense in that three to five year range. I just don't know if it's worth keeping the keeping a bus and keeping it going down the road. Or is it? That's kind of, you know, if it goes for two more years or if it's a total pile that's not worth keeping around for those two years, then. That's a lot of these wondering. different school districts that lease buses versus purchase them, the ones that have them purchased, they're changing them in and turning them back in in five years anyway to try to keep the rotation of the decent buses. From the, I did do a little survey with all the buses or local schools to find out, you know, do you lease, do you do, when I first got here to find out how they did it. And I was told that most of them end up turning them in in five years, the ones that don't have major problems with them. Did they, did they happen to say how much credit they were given for those buses when they turned them back in? No, I didn't ask that question. And I know, I don't remember exact things, obviously, Sid, because this has been several years back, but before we started doing the leasing program, mm -hmm. it was just issue after issue it felt like at board meetings we were talking about this bus issue and now we didn't have this bus and when you're not leasing you can't go to them to say can you give us a loaner there is no mm -hmm. loaner bus when you have right. an issue you just didn't get a bus so then we were down buses and that's when just the decision was made however many years ago that we looked into the leasing option knowing then there would be a continuous rotation of new buses coming into the fleet and that when those major mechanical problems that were happening and things we were facing, they really wouldn't be our problem. That we're kind of paying 
this leasing, and we know that then our payments are made on that, and it was something we could budget for because the transportation fund was even more in the red because you couldn't plan for the things that were happening. And one of our bigger <laughs> issues were when a bus went down, there, there was there was no no nothing to replace it. Like no one could help you. You were just we were out. Mm -hmm. It was be, beyond the scope of what our staff could repair. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, it was most often, you know, big things were going out on, on buses. And that's another thing. Right now we have a mechanic part-time. You would have to have a full-time mechanic. Mm -hmm. And at, at that time, we did have a full-time, and it still was. We're still going to do it. Okay. Just with parts and with the things that were going on, the cost of trying to replace some of the things that were happening on the buses. Because trying to main, hold on to that fleet longer, it was... Definitely was it a, <laughs> it was a bad moment. I do remember all of that. So I'm sure there's, you know, history of that somewhere in the records yeah. of. See, I wasn't around for that part. So that's why <laughs> I'm asking. Is it possible for the next two buses that are getting ready to go out in, uh, I think it's 25, 26, that we can actually track them from this point and see how much that it would have cost us for the warranty or t to actually have repaired, make the repairs that we need to. So that way we can have an accurate, uh, a, a better of a ballpark guess on what well, that's going to cost? Well, I could track of, of what maintenance that it would have needed and when it would need tires and everything else, mm -hmm. but as far as the unknowns that happen, as you apparently lived through, I can't give you those because I can't tell you what's going to break down on the mm -hmm. bus. I just mean for the five years that we'll have had those two buses that will go out in the next two years, if we know how much has already had to be replaced on it, Mm. It at least gives us a ballpark on saying that first five years would have cost us this much, this much extra, extra plus repairs plus are going to more frequent as it goes on down the road. Okay. So the ones that expire in 2026 yes. are the ones that you want me to go back and track because those have all been here since I've been here. If that's possible. Okay. That way we have two, a two bus example on maybe how much it would cost us to look into that. Okay. I can do that. When they, when they do the warranty work, do you get pricing information on that, even though we're not paying it? I know. Oh. I wonder if I, I don't oh, get that. that. So I can do that then. Yeah. yeah. I don't I know can. if they would give you, I don't know if they would tell you that or not. They'll give me the labor cost of what it would normally cost to do it if I ask them. And as far as the parts, of course, they're going to give me whatever it would cost us in general instead of what they got it for. But I should be able to get some kind of at least close to yeah. estimate of what we've had to do with all the warranty work. Fantastic. Anything else? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. If there's no other discussion, I need a motion and a second to approve the purchase and or lease recommend, rec I guess it's just a lease recommendation mm -hmm. in the fiscal year 25 transportation plan for Blue Ridge CUSD number 18 as presented. So moved. Derek? Second. Kenna? Yes. Yes. Okay, up next is consideration of the uh, Blue Ridge High School door lock mechanisms. So as some of you experienced tonight, um, we are not able to dog down the north door, the unit entrance. Um, that was a surprise on December 20th when we were having a meeting before the board meeting in December. Um, and from what I understand, I've learned from Rusty about door locks. Um, all door locks, including your home locks, are supposed to be serviced every year. Um, the door locks here in this building have not been serviced um, uh, when the pins inside decide that they're not going to move as they're supposed to, your key is not going to go into the lock and all of a sudden you cannot use the lock. So that's one of our major problems that we have here at the iSchool and we are losing doors um, kind of quickly. We also have some ADA compliance issues with some door knobs at the high school that need to be levers instead. And so Harry and David's um, not the people that make chocolate, but the people who do door locks um, have given us the estimate there. Um, I believe we're near $11,000 for the door lock repairs at the high school. So, um, and we do have, I, I guess in the unit office when that was, went through a remodel, which was 
somewhere around 2018 or 19, I believe. Um, we have what we call in there temporary door locks, which none of us really knew until Harry and David's came out and told us that. Um, and now that we've switched some offices, we need to have more security um, with those door locks. Because um, right now, the superintendent's office can be accessed with a um, high school key. So we have some work to do, and we would ask for your approval in doing so. I'm waiting for it to turn green. Does it need, oh, it doesn't need to turn green. Um, did we, do we have to go with this company or can we get more bids? We don't have to. They've come out and done all the work to, so we know exactly what we need. And they're a trusted, trusted company. And with that price, we're not required to go out for other bids. Okay. Any other comments, thoughts? Okay, if not, I need a motion and a second to replace the door hardware and core repairs for multiple doors at BRH, BRHS as presented. So moved. Derek. Second. Jonathan. Yes. 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 Up next is the consideration of the BRIJHS phase protection. Phase loss protection is something that we've talked about for um, those who have been on the board for a number of years due to uh, continually losing equipment on the roof of BRIJHS in terms of compressors in the Daikin units that we have there. It was recommended by GHR engineer Jim Gleason that we would do something. Mansfield loses power. Um, fairly regularly, and when we lose power, we run the risk of losing compressors in the Daikin units uh, very costly um, when we do that. In fact, um, what we just experienced during first semester was a whole entire system went down and took all the, the compressors with it. So while we are build, while we've built that, it's very important that we put this kind of like an insurance policy in place with it, which is the phase loss protection. Um, so that's something that we are looking at for the entire building and doing it in one location where it's all uh, shut down if they would lose power until we can see that the power is restored so we don't lose our equipment. Uh, the other option would be going to every single power supply that we wanted to protect, which would require going to back to every single power supply to turn them back on. So it seems a little bit um, not so ideal uh, when you're talking about a building that size. So it's our recommendation to approve option one um, for this HVAC project at Mansfield. Nothing? Oh, people. Okay. If there's no comments or questions, I need a motion and a second to approve the purchase and installation of phase loss protection equipment as outlined in option one for Blue Ridge CUSD number 18 as presented. So moved. Jason and Sig. Yes. 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 Up next is personal plan for FY25. Okay, so for next school year, this is about the time of year that we start looking at what our class sizes are. Um, in the last few years, we have added a second grade teacher to Snyder to make a three um, teacher grade level. And then the following year, we added a one teacher to third grade. And then the question goes, okay, what happens the next year at fourth grade? So I talked to Mr. Huddleston um, frequently and said that in my opinion, it's not a done deal that we would go to a third, fourth grade section. Um, both he and I come from districts where we were quite used to larger numbers um, when we get into the fourth grade level. Um, that being said, we've had conversations with Mr. Payton um, about the third, current third grade class moving into fourth grade. One of the things that we do consider is numbers and we are over 50 at that point, which is typically a, a marker where we would consider uh, splitting into three. Um, we are at 51, I believe, right now with that. Um, we also have to look at 
IEP numbers and we have to look at behavior numbers. And if you're aware of what we've been saying over the last couple months, we're, we're struggling with behaviors across the board, especially at the younger grades. Um, it's, not, um, it's not unique to Blue Ridge. I hear that from all of my superintendents that we're, COVID has impacted us in many, many ways and it may for some time. But the behaviors in the classroom um, take a lot of, a lot of extra energy and time from our staff. They're willing to do so, um, but sometimes it means putting together in groups of 25 and 26 might not be as desirable as 17s, um, where we can be a little bit more closely on top of what those behaviors are. It's also another way to split personalities that need to be away from each other. There's only so many corners in one classroom. Um, so in working with Mr. Payton and Mr. Huddleston, it would be my recommendation that we would um, consider adding a fourth grade position uh, for the upcoming school year. The next, there's three things lumped in there. I'll go to the next one. LBS1, that's a special education teacher. Uh, currently we have three special education teachers at BRIJHS. We're in a situation where there are different levels of need for our students. Obviously they're individualized plans, but we do have some students that are mostly, uh, more. I would say more heavily, uh, part of their day is spent in with a case manager. And when that happens both on the intermediate side and the junior high side at the same time, you could have the potential of having a fourth grade student in with a seventh or eighth grade student for the majority of the day. It's not ideal. Um, we want to make sure that we're doing what is best for our students and what's legal and what's recommended by Tri-County. And Tri-County feels like we've reached the place. We especially have a larger number coming into fourth grade. I believe seven students with IEPs coming into that grade level. Um, so it would be much wiser, much safer for the students and much safer legally um, if we had an additional case manager there. If you remember, we have a retiree in one of our special ed positions, so not only would we have to fill that position, but if we open a new one, we'd be looking for two. And right now, I think Mr. Huddleston says that we have four decent applicants for that position, woohoo, or positions. So um, that would be a recommendation. And then the Title I position currently filled by Kelly Soliday, um, she is able to, on her partial days, uh, she services and gives interventions for fourth, fifth, and sixth grade. There are no current interventions um, through a title teacher that are delivered at the seventh and eighth grade level. There never have been. Um, we are aware that that's very important. What we're doing with iReady is great, but iReady is a, is a program and we need human beings attached to that as well. There are lessons and humans can deliver those lessons, but we don't have the staff to do that right now. Um, I think it would be well worth considering and we have a, um, an applicant, uh, the current personnel who would like to be full time at this point, which would be fantastic. Um, and so I think she does an absolute wonderful job at the fourth or sixth level and I think if we could open up and make that a full time position, we'd be able to uh, have a stronger impact on the junior high level before they reach the high school which is something that would be a very nice transition for everyone. So that three-part recommendation is additional fourth grade position, additional LBS1, that's the special ed teacher, and then increasing the part-time title position at BRIJHS to full-time. What questions do you have? No questions? So shocking. <laughs> Just to verify, our third grade would go back to two after this? No. It would stay at three? Yes. Our numbers at second grade, grade are, oh, are high okay. as well. Yeah. Yeah. What has happened in the past, Chelsea, and this was maybe before you were on the board, it's kind of in my very first year uh, as curriculum coordinator, there used to be a lot of shuffling between grade levels and we would just see that swell. Um, and so somebody might be assigned to kindergarten one year if they went to three sections and then they go up to first grade and then they might drop back down to kindergarten. And that was quite frustrating for the staff members. You can understand that very well. Um, we've been fortunate that we've not had to go back down. After we've expanded, we've been able to hold with those numbers. Um, and right now, um, again, I'm not one that is usually a proponent for extremely small class sizes. Uh, that's never been part of what I felt like was the most important factor. Um, but when you see the behaviors um, well, and the work that's- in one grade level is That's a lot for us, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So uh, we, have to, we have to be mindful of that and make sure that we're prepared to give the best. And usually your move-ins come when, gentlemen? <laughs> or the middle of August, right? When, when you have all your class lists done, then boom, you get a surprise. <laughs> so um, we want to be prepared for that and not be behind. Right now they're scrambling. Um, Bert and Shauna spend a lot of time doing minutes with, um, you know, being paraprofessionals in this place or that place because yeah. we just don't, don't have the coverage. I don't know how you guys fulfill all the mid minutes with just as many special ed teachers yeah. as you have. Yeah. I don't really remember, but um, where are we at on fifth grade class size? Are we two teachers right now or three? Two. Moving forward, or do we just have two? So we would need to continue moving, growing based on the class size. Yeah. Potentially, okay. yeah. It's not a given. As they get a little bit older, they have a, you know, a little bit more understanding of how to deal in the building and, and do what they need to do. But currently, four, five, and six is two, two, two. Okay. Okay. If there are no further uh, questions, I need a mo motion and a second to approve the addition of a fourth grade teaching position and an LBS one teaching position at BRI JHS for the 24-25 school year and to increase the title one position at BRI JHS from part-time to full-time beginning the 24-25 school year as presented. So. <laughs> Kenna and Chelsea. <laughs> Chelsea's down here, like, trying her hardest, like, she's waiting. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I could yes. hear you. Yes. Yes. Okay. Up next is the consideration of the high school course catalog updates. I'll give a brief overview, and then if Mr. Easter would like to hop in for anything, we can do that as well. Um, so the math department had approached Mr. Easter. Um, we want to make sure that we're meeting the needs of our high school students as they're coming in. We're all aware that the 7th and 8th grade math position has been difficult to keep filled. Um, I know we intentionally did harm to it this last time by pulling uh, Mrs. Cole Ross into an administrative position, but I believe at my last count in the seven years that I've been here, we've had six different teachers in that classroom for teaching 7th and 8th grade math. That's really rough. Um, that's a, not a lot of consistency. As a former 7th and 8th grade math teacher, I can say those are the best years of math and the, a very critical time in math. That's where if you can get a full understanding in 7th grade and 8th grade math, you can be a fully functioning adult. If you don't get those skills, then most likely for the rest of your life, that's going to be a handicap area and you're going to say, well, I can't do that because I can't do math. Um, very critical skills right there. Um, it's very important to me that we're supporting our kids. Number one, we're working on how can our coaches that we hire from the ROE help with the instructional process of math, because typically if you are a middle school math teacher or an intermediate math teacher, you're not a math major. I feel very passionate about that, um, and I want to make sure that we continue to work on what we would call our tier one instruction in math. iReady is also going to be a helper. But at this point, our real life situation is that when we have students come into the high school, they are often, we often have a good pocket of them that are ill-equipped to go straight into Math 1. And when they don't do well in Semester 1 of Math 1, they fail that, then they're still sitting in that Semester 2, correct? But typically not going to fare very well. And so then they're having to start the repeat cycle. And what does that do to your mentality about math when you're on that repeat cycle? So the thought is that we would very carefully identify students who needed to slow that progression down. They would start with the math one content and they would split it into two years. They would call it practical integrated math A and B, the freshman year A, the sophomore year B. Um, I feel very strongly, and I was part of the, Brian, let me be part of these meetings. This is not going to be a no homework class. This is not going to be a, I'll just sit and do what I feel like and take a slower pace. This is going to be where we have the same expectations for what you do during class, what you do after class. And my analogy that I use is if you go in the front door with somebody and they don't understand the concept, then it's your job to find a way to go through the side window. So Mr. Mentier is a very astute teacher with our younger math students and being able to diagnose what the situation is with their understanding instead of just repeating the same thing over and over and over again, which has shown not to work. Um, um, so I feel very confident that um, with Mr. Mentier in that place that we're going to be able to provide for those students who need it an opportunity to take a practical math A and a practical math B 
as a freshman and a sophomore. Then in their junior year, they go into math two, and then they would have the opportunity to go into transitional math um, after that. So they could be involved for four years, they could be involved for three years. To be meeting up with state standards, they have to have at least a year of algebra, at least a year of geometry. Our courses are integrated, so they would get that over time. They would meet that requirement. So we're not through the final um, approval stage yet with ROE and ISBE, um, but we would like your permission to make this change once we get the final word from ROE and ISBE. So, Brian, do you want to add anything before they question? Would those courses be by recommendation only or like how, you know? I, I feel like we have to kind of like triangulate the data. We need to look at the iReady scores. We need to look at the classroom scores. Um, we need to look at teacher recommendation uh, because it's a very serious decision to put somebody in that course. If they don't belong there, we have to start looking into then what's going to happen. If we identify you being in um, practical integrated math A, one, A, A, sorry, A, <laughs> during the first semester of your freshman year, and you're zipping through, we need to bump you up into Math 1. If, for some reason, all the information that we got in your eighth grade year was incorrect, and you just, poof, matured mathematically over the summertime. If you, um, if you have somebody who is in... Mathematical maturement, I just... <laughs> <laughs> if you have somebody who's in Math 1, and we see that by semester one they have failed, then we need to make sure that we have space in those courses so that person could go down to an A and be able to continue to be able to get back on a success track moving forward. So a lot of those inner workings were still working on that piece. But yes, it's going to have to be, you can't just pick that you want to be in there. You need to be the right student to be in that class. And the other thing is, this is not, this will not be a permanent fixture. I would like to think that we outgrow the need for this over time, um, but we're not there. And if we continue to ignore it, we're gonna continue to have a problem. And that's not fair to the kids. Okay. There are no further questions or comments. I need a motion and a second to approve the math department updates to the FY25 BRHS course catalog pending final ROE and ISB approval for Blue Ridge CUSD number 18 as presented. So moved. Yeah. <laughs> Jason and Fig. <laughs> oh, Chelsea's wow. Just out. Just well, it's I cold know, over Fig. there. I, know, cold. <laughs> I even gave you a second and then you came in with a second. <laughs> yes. Yes. Up next is the consideration of administrative structure at BRHS. Okay. So uh, we talked a little bit about transition plan last month, and part of our conversation um, is structured around the high school and what the board's plan would be going forward. So since the 21-22 school year, you have approved um, an interim assistant principal. That's been Mary Diener. Um, she's typically working three days a week. That's what a retiree is allowed to do. They're capped at 120 days. Um, so we've had that support, and in that time, I'll just kind of read from what I wrote. We've, in addition to working through COVID-19 aftermath, a building leadership team has been formed, MTS structure, MTSS structures have been developed, productive leadership team and MTSS tiered meetings are occurring monthly, PBIS has been instituted at the high school, that's amazing, and SEL lessons have been designed and implemented with the, with the full student body. That work happens when you have multiple administrators. It's not possible for one um, administrator to have everybody in the building reporting to that one person. Jason's referred to that many times with a, you know, your uh, structure that you have inside of a building. Um, and so I would, I would like to see if the board would consider having a full-time person there. Can, can the building go forward with one person? Yes, you're gonna get a manager. And that's going to be a totally different look than what you have right now. I feel like we're making, we're making progress. Are there growth pains? Absolutely. We didn't have, we didn't have these changes happening um, previously. And so when somebody comes in and we start moving forward, some are going to be on board and some are going to say, ouch, right? And that's, we knew that was going to happen because we've had the same administrator here for a long time. So any kind of change is going to be difficult, but... 
with all of that being accomplished in the last couple of years, that's amazing. And we're doing what's good for kids because we're having discussions about them and making plans and actually doing the plans instead of sitting there and saying, yeah, so and so struggling. We talked about them last month. I don't know what we're going to do. And you walk out of the meeting. So um, if we want things like that to happen and more, then I feel like we definitely need a two person administrative team at the high school. Um, I'm surprised whenever people tell me about you know, what's been added at, at Burt's building. They thought that um, he'd be able to slow down a little bit. Now two people are running all day long, um, trying to you know, deal with the situations that come up every day, plus do all the planning and the collaboration meetings that you do and the IEP meetings and the 504 meetings. You know, it's, it's busy all day long. Um, I, I often, I know this has nothing to do with O&M, but I often kind of chuckle when, when Rusty comes in and he's just absolutely amazed at, you can, you can sit at the board table, Rusty being a board member previously, and you hear what we tell you, right? You're not here on a daily basis. Then when you come in and work it and you see how hard everybody's working all day long, every day, it's like, oh wow. <laughs> I didn't know all that was going on. So um, our principals do an awesome job. So that's our, that's our request. And I'm not sure what your thoughts or your questions might be on that. That would that role be like a, a vice principal, assistant principal? What's that called? I think it would be termed assistant principal. Assistant What's principal? really the difference between all those names? It, I yeah. don't know. Okay. It, they do everything from you know they would be running. There would be a division of labor that would take some time to figure out what are the skill sets, who who is the best one to do this or that. But one person doing all IEP meetings, one person doing 504 meetings, all of the there's monthly staff meetings. ILT meetings, tier one meetings, tier two meetings, tier three meetings. For all of that to happen, you have to have personnel because an administrator is sitting in on every one of those, um, plus the day-to-day -day stuff. Right. So my question was more around qualifications for that person to completely fulfill, like let's say we lost a principal in a building and they, there was that assistant principal. Would they be, would that position be fully qualified to take over? Yeah. The, administer and admi the administrative certification is called the Type 75, and that person is able to evaluate, and it's a general administration degree, so that could go K-12. So the big change is all the additional programs. I guess, did it just not have those when I was in school? The tiered programs? That well, like was all of them. I don't know. Yeah, I that mean, was or probably were not we just all by the time. Really a lot better behaved. I, I mean, I'm just wondering. I missed the I, beginning part of that. Sorry. I know, or was I just a lot better behaved? Because I don't think that was it. It's just uh, I don't think we ever had assistant principals when I was growing up. Yeah, the the tiered structure. I mean, RTI was a legal mandate. I can't remember how many years ago. Um, I don't. Okay. Okay. So in the last 10 years, a lot of a lot of things have changed. Well, we've talked about school code has doubled in the last 10 years. So by law, you have to have an RTI program. We call it MTSS, Response to Intervention. It just means you have to be able to track every student. You figure about, we'll go back to the bell curve here, about 80% of your kids are going to do fine with me presenting instruction, them comprehending and moving on, behaving well, right? Then there's the ones who don't. So you have to put another another layer of something in place. That's called an intervention, be it academic, behavioral, or both. Mm -hmm. Somebody has to track if that's actually being done and then if there's any progress. And then you have to meet again and decide, okay, now what do we do with that information? So all of that stuff, all of that information, all of those conversations have to happen and all that data has to be recorded. Um, and then that would be if we get to tier two and that doesn't work, then we do more intensive interventions with tier three. And if that doesn't work, then we're looking at do they qualify for an individualized education plan. Did all that exist a long time ago? No. Um, so there's, there's more stuff to do all the time. Um, and that just takes a lot of time and a lot of meetings and a lot of personnel. Is it good for kids? I think when you can have teams like that that function well, yes, because you can catch some kids who, you know, there's just a little hiccup in what they're learning, and if you can figure out how to get to that and address it early on, good for them. That might be able to turn around a, a whole perspective about their educational career. 
Is there a tiered level that we could look at as well uh, versus hiring strict out uh, type 75 or is there a, is there a dean of students uh, that, is that a position that can actually cover some of what we do but it's not a full principal's position? Um, I think you could do a dean of students. I don't believe they would have to have, Unit 4 does that a lot, so I'm looking at the gentleman. I don't know that you have to have your administrative certification for that. You're still counted, kind of coded as a teacher. You're one of those in-between quasi-administrators. Um, that person would be full-time. They would do discipline. Um, I don't know how much of the, the MTSS role they would take. I don't know how much of the IEP meeting they would take because they don't have the same level of training. Um, I don't know that there would be a big financial difference between what you would have to pay a student dean and what you would pay an assistant principal. That was one of my other questions yeah. on whether or not that would help us out, either preparing for that next step, somebody who is newer and doesn't have it but is working towards it so that we're actually potentially preparing for the next evolution of the school district. So It's a possibility. I think anybody that you're gonna get in, if there was a position that was opened up at the high school, either as a dean of students or an assistant principal, you're gonna get somebody who's brand new, most likely. People don't move in assistant principal positions laterally unless there's a, like a geographic reason. And the individual that's hired has to be, have that level of training in order to work with these plans. It's not something that uh, you could have a, a secretary or something like that. That's not no. no those okay. those decisions have to be administrative. You're assigning you're assigning interventions. Um, that has to be certified staff. That's to, gotcha. uh, administrator needs to be involved in those decisions. What are your thoughts over there, Chelsea? You're rubbing your head. <laughs> Mostly, it's just frustration that all that we have all these unfunded mandates. That's what it is right now. Mr. Easter, I'm assuming that were we to lose the position that Ms. Diener has been filling, you would see a significant backward slide in your overall ability to manage and what's the improvements that she's we've made over the last couple of years, now. correct? Yeah, she's not been paid with district funds. I wouldn't be able to email her unless right now Mary Bell's mandated. But with the DAD. And on top of that, you um, you have evals to do, correct? Yeah. Okay. Do you have to have a type 75 to do the evaluations? Um, yeah. Well, Shauna, as a student dean, um, she had she, to finish that. Or yeah. Yeah, I've never been in a district that had evaluators that were not type 75 certified. The only reason why I'm asking these questions is just to see if there are any other options that are out there on the table that mm -hmm. anybody else is doing differently, still being able to accomplish the tasks that you need done, but perhaps in a way that's a little bit easier on the district as well. But I don't know that I'm asking the right questions for that either. Yeah, I, I think there are some, I mean, I think the difference would be between a student dean and an assistant principal. And what would the difference be financially? Um, I don't know, a rough guess might be $10,000. Um, I think both are going to be brand new. Both are going to take a lot of training from Mr. Easter to get them acclimated to the district and to their job because, like I said, they're they're going to be brand new. They won't have experience with this, so they'll have to learn what their areas of expertise are. If they've been a, you know, a teacher leader before, that might help. They might have a, a natural bent towards some of the MTSS processes, but we'll have to see.
How many kids do we have in the high school that have the indivi individualized education plans? 30. You have and a 504 the, number? You have a large number of 504s as well. Uh, yeah, they're, yeah. <laughs> they're smart. <laughs> That's Mary. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, what are the total, what's the total number in the high school this year? 185. How do we decrease the IEPs in the, I mean, the special program? How do you do, uh, what do you do? <laughs> Am I asking the wrong question? It's probably totally inappropriate or something. I have no idea. The goal of special ed is to always get them out of special ed. Um, you just have some kiddos that, for whatever reason, they're going to stay with you. Um, so it's not like we're trying to keep them in. Right. Our job is, you, uh, I always said a special ed teacher's job is to put themselves out of a job. Like, you, you don't want your students. You want them back in the gen ed curriculum. Um, the question that you're, I think you're getting at is, are we over-diagnosing kids with, are we over-diagnosing kids who have disabilities who should not be into special ed? And that would be, we do that through um, Tri-County, correct? Right. Education definitely isn't getting easier. Doesn't sound like it. Yes. And I don't know if we've always had three case managers at the high school. I, I don't know. Yeah. Is there a plan B on this at all? Or is it is the only plan that we have to look at for another full-time administrator? And I'm not trying to, I, I'm just always looking for a, a backup plan anyways, yeah. but. Yeah. Um, Mary Diener's been paid out of, out of um, grant funds this time. This year wasn't part of the plan. She's paid out of a different grant this year. How long would we continue? There's other transition pieces as well that we need to you know, consider the whole package, which is not exactly what we're talking about at this moment. But would there be another plan? Yeah, there's always a plan of you saying, no, thank you, and we have nobody there to help. Um, I don't. I don't think, other than a retiree situation, that you could get somebody else to be part time. That's unusual. But like I said, a retiree is limited to 120 days. Are there other retired administrators that might want to come and do this? 
Mary Diener is a very unique bird in that she doesn't want to be retired. She wants to have a purpose, and she, she's just awesome. Um, she comes in, and uh, she never worked at a high school before, but you would never know that from the work that she does. She just meshes with what's going on very well. Could you come across another part-timer to do that? It would have, I would think it would have to be a retiree, and I don't know that there's a lot of retirees like a Mary Diener who want to come back to a high school and right work part-time. <laughs> yeah, that's a very unusual situation that we've had her and had her for a number of years. So the realistic situations would be looking at a full-time person either under one title or a different title, you know, assistant principal or dean of students, or um, looking for that odd situation where you can get a retiree or saying no thanks and we'll just go with one and see what we get. I don't know if you can, Mr. Easter, think of another situation in there. When you create a position, um, do you create like an effectiveness plan that says, okay, we're going to see, we're going to add this person, and we think, here's what we think we're going to achieve with this, and then, you know, let's track it for a couple years and see, okay, this position was not as effective as we thought, let's take the next step. Is that like something you can do on the front end when you're hiring someone in for a position like that? All of our administrators, other than myself, are on one-year contracts. And so that's you know, one safety net that we have where if we decide that this is no longer needed or it's not working the way we wanted it to, right. 
then sometimes you'd have to make those hard decisions. Um, you know, for example, with Mrs. Colvross coming out of teaching and going into administration, by the way, she is uh, fully done with her coursework. and We're just waiting for paperwork to follow. We'll give her the title of assistant principal soon. Um, but she would have the right to go back into the classroom. So if, you know, somebody maintains their ability to go back in the classroom and teach if we find that this couple of years from now is, is not the direction that the district wants to go in. is more along the lines of like what specific goals you know can you know do we think or what metrics would we look at to say this has really helped let's keep it you know like I'm assuming that you know what if you know we're not going to know immediately how well this is going to work out right so we say okay everybody votes and we say yay let's do it and then two years down the line Half of us aren't here anymore, and a new group of people came by, and they get asked the question, do you want to keep this position or not, you know? And they go, I don't know. What do we have to compare it to? What was the reason? What did we do? What did we accomplish? And if we don't have that from the beginning going into this, you know, here's what we want to accomplish, and here's how we're going to measure this, right? Making a, a smart goal for this position. Uh, it doesn't have to be anything that's like extremely detailed. It just says, you know, hey, here's our goal, right? And we can have a general sense of like how we're doing on that goal as part of as part of that position evaluation or something like that. You know, mm -hmm. like you would you would say because to me, I think it's a combination of the strategic plan because I don't own that solely. That gets owned by the whole admin team because okay. there's a lot of academic pieces on there that they have to be able to uphold, and that's yeah. part of the structures that we're talking about, the MTSS structure. So if those are continuing to go in the positive direction of helping kids, then yes, that position is effective. Exactly how um, job duties would be delineated, that takes a little bit of time. You can put something on a piece of paper, but you really have to live it before you can tell. Mm -hmm. But then that's also a part of the evaluation process because as a superintendent evaluating, I need to know if, if you're assigned to 504 in this part of MTSS, then I can tell if that person's being successful or not. So that's kind of internal structures that would go between strategic plan, evaluation of the person them themselves, and the job description. Okay. So would perhaps one of the goals be a reduction? Uh, this is my lack of education on education here. but. One of those metrics might be the reduction of people, kids in IEP, in the IEP, IEP stuff. Like, what if no, you cut not. that and what if they worked their way out into, you know, that's the goal, right? Get it them out of the special ed classes. Many factors that are out of the out of control for that. Oh. Yeah. I think it'd be like complaining to the dentist that you have cavities. Hmm. He's obviously not doing a good enough job. <laughs> I say so I've worked in a building previously where um, all of the kids that needed to be brought to the MTSS table to be discussed. You know, we often talk in percentiles. We say everybody below the 25th percentile on certain testing needs to be talked about at a table to see if we need to do anything else. I've worked in a building before where even the lowest 10th percentile was not gonna get to the table in the full course of a year because there were just such great needs in that student population, it was going to be impossible. Um, we're not in that situation here, but if we don't have the manpower, we're not going to get to the kids who have those very basic needs and be able to turn that around for them. Does that mean dismissing an IEP? Not necessarily, but could it mean um, a student being more successful and having better um, results for the instruction that they're receiving? Absolutely. So. Unfortunately, I don't think the state is going to not provide us with a whole other list of unfunded mandates that mm -hmm. this person will probably fall into the role of fulfilling. Um, there's already a whole lot that 
Mary Diener's been doing for us, and I feel like we probably need to continue somebody in that role, and I don't think casting a small net by asking for another part-time position is going to probably scoop up any good fish, so it's probably best for us to seek this position. So can you, we keep talking about student growth and when I think of what leads most to student growth, it's phenomenal teachers, no offense. You guys are great. But if we're wanting to, I guess I'm just trying to figure out how exactly is the second administrator going to allow students to continue learning more at their current pace if they're not actually instructing the students. Does that make sense? Like they're helping with the meetings, they're helping with the planning, but they're not actually teaching the kids. So how does that correlate? Somebody has to make the, the connection to sit at the table and decide what are the other um, interventions that are going to be used, who's going to be working with the student, who's going to be checking in with the student, um, what are we going to be doing differently. Somebody has to make that connection with the teacher and then go back and check with the teacher. You know, how are those interventions working? How could we do something differently? What do you suggest? You see this child every day. You've met with them for daily or twice daily for six weeks. What have you noticed? How can you help us make the next best decision? Mm -hmm. And then we go out and research if we need to bring in other interventions. That's, that's the manpower that, um, you know, when teachers are working from morning bell to afternoon bell, all they're doing is delivering the service, not all they're doing, but they're, they're doing the, the, the daily work. There's no time in there for all the extra planning that goes into every special need that's represented out there. So that so, to me is, that person is making that connection and making sure, yes, I've made the phone call home to the parent. I've invited them to the meeting. We're talking about this child together. What can we do differently at home to get you to come to school? A lot of our, 20% of our report card is chronic uh, absenteeism, mm -hmm. that's whether you're excused or unexcused. And the state just said, hey, take five mental health days if you want them, but you're going to get dinged on your report card. 20% of your report card is going to be based on excused and unexcused absences altogether. Oh, and your COVID absences too? Please stay home. But, oh, ding. <laughs> Sorry, somebody had COVID, so now they're hitting against you. So yeah. so what, what you're describing to me, though, sounds more like an interventionist, like another teacher to really help read the data, direct all that, more so than another administrator. But a high school structure is very different because we don't have intervention. We have a math lab. We're trying to see if we can get an English lab, but interventions are very different. They're, um, it, it, it's not gonna, they're not gonna go to a certain place at a certain time of day. We don't have a high school structure for that. So it's not gonna be the person who's like increasing title at the intermediate junior high, yes, that's going to be an instructional impact right there. This person is gonna do a lot of the coordination to help the gen ed teachers know what they can be doing differently. So are they gonna instruct? No, Brian's not instructing other than, well, I mean, having every conversation with a kid who makes a mistake is definitely instruction, but it's not formalized instruction. Or just handing out A's. Like a, it's a coordinator. No, that's what police officers do. Oh. <laughs> wow. 
Going for great. the firefighter next. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of like um, Jason over there where I feel like there has to be another, a different avenue. As an educator, do you have another idea? I'm, I'm working on it. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> I feel like there has to be some, some way to work in, work within what we have to do by law and what we need to do to meet the needs. I, what we have to do by law could be done by one person as a manager, mm -hmm. but you're not going to make quality decisions. No. Um, so it's a, it's a matter of quality and, and how you want to invest. That's what it is. And like Brian said before, I don't take this lightly either. I, I appreciate the, the struggle and the, the tension of trying to figure out, you know, is this the right decision to make? I appreciate that. Um, and if this can't be a January decision, if you want to uh, be thinking on it after you've heard the discussion and the questions that your colleagues have I, I have, have a asked. Question. Would I be able to like come in and like shadow you? <laughs> He's like anyone but Chelsea. <laughs> 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 no, I like I just I would like to see because I mean I was a high school special ed teacher, but it's also been well Saul's five, so it's been five years since I've been in a high school. I would like to see what's changed what stayed the same and just get a real feel would that be allowed i don't want to be a teacher for the day i did that once <laughs> okay <laughs> i'll bring the donuts I guess, based off of one of Chelsea's earlier comments, not just that one, um, when you were asking about, you know, providing the instruction for the kids and what is this for the kids, when I'm listening to this conversation, reading the things, I'm, while I feel it will benefit the kids, I see it more as providing that additional support for the staff so that they can better instruct the kids. Like, that's, to me, how I'm viewing this person, similar to when we made the decision for over at Mansfield. It's like, this person is then providing that person that the, the teachers can have to go to to talk about what, what approaches do we have for this student or what do we do in this situation. It's just that other person that's providing that for them. And I feel like if we don't have the right supports in place for the staff to go to when they're dealing with all these other things, then how can they truly just go into class and teach math or teach English or teach history or whatever needs done for each student? So for me, that's kind of... Just my first go-to is always going to other teachers to find out, like, what are you experiencing with this student? What have you done in the past with similar situations? Very rarely would I go to the principal and ask for guidance on what I should do, or at Fisher at the, with the assistant principal. It was always I would go to the people that were st still currently working with the student, giving them instruction. So to me... I would always want more, and I, I don't know how it would work at the high school, but I would always want more teachers rather than more administrators. But I, I'm assuming that the administrative load has grown exponentially in five years. So it's that, that balance. And a lot, of, a lot of the conversation at the tier two table is with all the teachers of student A present mm -hmm. talking about what do you notice in your classroom? How do you respond? Is it a male teacher versus a female teacher? Is it morning versus afternoon? Um, but having everybody there at the same time, which can only happen when it's before or after school, if you want to get everybody all together. Mm -hmm. Could you talk to teachers one at a time? Yes, but I think you get a great picture when everybody's together. And then the administrator's making the decision, okay, what do we do with what we just heard? What's the next plan gonna be? Who's gonna contact the parent? Who's gonna contact the teacher? Who's gonna implement such and such? Because maybe they get along with teacher Z who's not at the table because they don't have that teacher this year, but somebody has to go make that contact as well. And for those things to be done with fidelity, um, it, it just takes manpower. Yeah. So. And, and I just want to add to that because I think that's, the, that's what I see Brian and Mary doing is leading that effort and facilitating that 
communication and that engagement with their leadership skills. And I just want to say firsthand, I have seen the work that both Brian and Mary put into building the relationships, I think, with the students. I think they do a really good job of, d of doing that in this building. And um, I think that if you look at, like, we're going to go into doing an evaluation tonight and looking at all the progress overall that the district has made and keeping with that momentum, to me, it makes sense to continue to support that effort and look at here's the overall needs. We're not going to necessarily change those needs overnight, and I think we're going to continue to see more needs of our student population. And I, w I would like to continue to see the positive growth and, again, keep with that momentum, if I'm making sense. Mm -hmm. So it just makes sense to me, and I don't know if I'm articulating it well, but um, I can see it as a parent of a student in this school. So I, I, hope, I hope that's helpful. Thank you. Something else, I mean, you know, you, all the principals handle about the same number of years of students, right? Mm -hmm. When is, I mean, does Peyton just get them young enough that they're soft and nice and still wonderful? Or, because he's got it, he's doing it all on his own too. Yeah. And if he was here, I would ask him to speak. He's yeah. struggling. He's he's in a he's in a classroom, dealing with behaviors. You know, side by side, hand over hand with with kids. Um, probably eighty percent of his time during a week. It's it's a lot. Will, you have given the permission to add a social work position. We did have a recent candidate, um, somebody who's still in school. If we were to add a social work position that would dramatically help at the elementary building. But Ryan is, is probably out and in classrooms 80% of the time, if not more. I, I know that Mr. Payton's been really busy in this recent year, but also I believe he inherited the most senior staff when he took over with the most experience and the least turnover in his building, correct? And that makes a big difference too. Yeah. Right now, Paige because of the behavior situations, Paige is stationing herself there at least three days a week um, to assist because sometimes there's multiple behaviors at the same time and in order to handle them appropriately in the best way possible, it takes multiple people. Um, but she's reported back to me, I don't know how he does it. <laughs> and she's had that job before. So that's just another way to see it's, it's really changed over the years. And will that ebb and flow? Yeah, but right now, like I said, Snyder's not unique. We're hearing it from all other districts that everybody is struggling in that area. And I've just read something recently, or I was on a legal update, I think it was, and they were talking about, yeah, the number of, we're going to have to start reporting how many social workers we have and psychologists we have, because the state is seeing that they were just understaffed for what the needs are in general right now. And how on earth are you going to be able to find the people to fill those positions? been kind of a downer. <laughs> okay. Are there any other thoughts? Do you want more? <laughs> From people other than Chelsea? Hey. <laughs> do you want to do you want to wait until you're done with your shadowing Chelsea? I mean, I can try and get it done ASAP. I, I, wait, today's only Wednesday. I do leave Friday for a funeral. So you just want to put it off till next month? Table it. Is it urgent, Hillary, or can we put it off a month? Um, it's just a matter of if we decide to move forward and, and getting the best candidates with hiring, I would say that... Um, if we waited till next month, we would want to, just in case, have have a plan and a timeline ready, um, because this this is the time where people are looking. 
right now. Is it possible to go ahead and move forward having a plan and a timeline and then it can be one and done in February if that's the way it goes? I mean, still having everything set up and ready to go, but just not approved. Yeah, so getting it ready and yeah, I mean, just kind of lining out how long you'd want to make the posting for and and like salary. Who the interview I don't remember team would reading be. a salary. No, we didn't talk about that. Okay. So we would have to look at, you know, kind of the studies. Bushu does like a an average for the surrounding area. We could look at that. Kind of depends on what candidate we get to, um, but most likely they're going to be a brand newbie. Um, so yeah, we could do all the all the thinking and the legwork behind it and have it ready to go if the board said yes in February, and then if not, then we figure out what we do. Yeah. Uh, I think 20, no, 21. 21. That's Garrett's birthday. You still have to come. Chelsea, are you gonna like type up a report for us on your findings and I will live stream it. No, I'm kidding. No, thank uh. you. No, thank you. <laughs> uh, that way we have something to go off of on the February yeah. meeting. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So do we want to table this discussion until next month, put it on old business? Yes. Is that what people are comfortable with? Yeah. Okay. So I guess that's what we'll do. No vote. Okay. He's just so excited for our He's like, oh, good Lord. <laughs> Hazard pay. <laughs> Would you like uh, Chelsea to have a surrogate? That will take significant explanation to staff. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. They're like, what's going on? Okay, up next we have consideration of floor scrubber proposal. Uh, you saw Rusty's memo in there. We haven't had functioning um, floor scrubbers in the Farmer City um, campuses for a couple of years. Uh, so they were hand mopping floors and they were not getting done as frequently as would be ideal. Um, so Rusty has a proposal for you, one with a, um, for a riding machine for this building because the square footage is significantly more and the usage is more, and then a push behind machine for Snyder. Um, we do have uh, machines that are old, they're not being made anymore, but the company that we're looking at buying from would do a buyback so they can have a few spare, par spare parts on hand for fixing other things. So, yes, that was purchased not too long ago, maybe right before Bert. I think they used to share one here, it would go between the buildings. Scrub the sidewalk as you go. <laughs> Street sweeper. <laughs> <laughs> okay, are there any questions or comments? If not, I need a motion and a second to approve the proposal to purchase two floor scrubbers for Blue Ridge CUSD number 18 as presented. So moved. Derek and Sid. Yes. 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 Okay. And then I need a motion and a second to move from open session to closed session for the appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, dismissal of specific employees of the district at, oh my goodness, mm -hmm. is that right? Yeah. 906. So, second. Use your microphone. So, Sig and Derek. Yes. 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 